Good morning, and thank you for being with us. And a hearty thank you to FlowServe as well for convening this wonderful event. And thank you to all of you in the audience for taking the time to be with us today. I have three quick housekeeping notes, and I think some of them may actually tarnish the glowing introduction I was just given. The first one is, I, even though I sit in Houston, I am actually a Cowboys fan, so I'm hoping some of you 214 area code folks will give me a little bit of forbearance on that basis. Second, I'm an attorney, commodity markets analyst at Yes Wall Street and Defense Department China and Russia guy by training. And so you have to operate on me with, on, with me on the principle of trust but verify. But third, the good news from this is I'm very comfortable with questions, even adversarial ones. And so I encourage you to fill up the chat box and we'll reserve some time at the end to be able to handle those. Now, if we could just dive right into the presentation. Next slide, please. So one of the key things that we always wanna think about is why does energy matter to us? And you see the images on here and what you see is it's something that is really life transformational. If, if, if we think about ourselves as a species, Homo sapiens has changed a little bit over the last 250 to 270,000 years, but not that much in physical terms and the way our brains are wired and so forth. One thing though that has changed tremendously is the abundance of energy that we now enjoy in many parts, but not all parts of our current world. And really the way to think about energy, it's something that's a force multiplier. Instead of having a horse-drawn cart go 15 miles, you can have a truck carry many times the amount of goods for 500 miles a day through any kind of weather almost and being able to do it over and over and over. And then when you think about the liberation and productivity aspect, and this is something that speaks especially strongly to me as a father with, uh, who has two daughters among my children, is instead of somebody having to haul water or chop firewood, they turn on an electric motor and a pump and a well, or they open a spigot that allows natural gas to come in, and then you can heat, you can cook, you can do all the other tasks and avail yourself of the services that energy would deliver to us. Energy poverty kills and energy abundance brings life and improves life. Next slide, please. So before we jump into BTUs and some of the traditional ways we talk about energy, I think it's important to first compare BTUs to burgers. So we have a human scale reference here. And yes, we're in Texas, but we don't use oil. At least I don't use oil to season my hamburgers. However, the burger is a great illustration tool. The 550 or so calories you have in a Big Mac equals about 2,200 British thermal units. What this means is you have on the order of 2,600 Big Macs worth of energy in each barrel of crude oil. And this kind of gives us a sense as the world has transitioned from muscle power to mechanical power, the tremendous uplift we need in energy to be able to make things work. In a single day now, the world uses an amount of oil that if I have my numbers right, is equal to about 264 billion Big Macs. If you consider just McDonald's sales in the US market, it would take about 450 years to sell that many. And if you wanna think about what this means in terms of the price we pay for energy. A, a Big Mac, I believe, is now about $6 here in the U.S. market. To get enough of those to equal the energy in a barrel of oil, it sets you back almost $16,000. And here today, we think crude oil is expensive at $100. So really, really gives you an illustration of what we're working with here. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as we think about energy transitions, one of the things to remember is this isn't just something that's arisen in the last 12, you know, the last 10 years, or the last 20 years. We've been undergoing energy transitions for centuries, really. For most of our history, it was basically whatever was available in terms of biomass is what we used as fuel. This changed dramatically with the start of the Industrial Revolution. And what we've seen since then is you have a 50 to 100 year cycle where a fuel rises and then it's replaced by others. Part of this is driven by logistics and some of the things we're using the fuels for. And part of it is also has historically been driven by a search for energy density. When you move from wood to coal, you get about a 50% uplift in energy density per uh, mass unit of material. When you move from coal to oil, you get a similar leap. 
We've started to see a few more wrinkles on this theme. For instance, natural gas is not quite as energy dense as coal or oil, but you have other benefits, especially its cleanliness. And now as we think of contemporary energy transition efforts, we're looking at sources that are much lower in their emissions profile, like wind and solar, but also much less energy dense. And there's some pretty significant intended implications that we have to consider uh, as we look at these transition trends. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that remains very much a part of the world, even though we've seen trillions collectively in investment over the last 15 years in renewable energy resources, is we're still very carbon centric and the carbon centricity is no longer something that just exists in the OECD high income countries world. Many of these fuels, particularly coal, but also oil now, the non-OECD world is really the big demand driver. And as we look at some of the other fuel types, you know, things with the lower emissions profile, the hydros, the nuclear, the renewable sector, it's something where it's a little more balanced between them. Hydro is non-OEC dominated at this point. That's in a big part because of China's role. But when we look at nuclear and renewables, it's something that I think in the future we see proliferation in the non-OECD parts of the world, but it's still very much dominated by some of the high income industrialized countries where energy demand has been relatively stagnant and flatlined over the last couple of decades. Next slide, please. Now, you may ask, why is carbon so sticky in the system? One of the things is that it stores energy exquisitely well, and it's also easy to handle. We have an internal joke among my colleagues and I that if gasoline hadn't have uh, been found when we first distilled a barrel of crude oil, we probably would have invented it because it's such a good energy carrier. And it, it kind of gives us a reference point as we look at the roles that coal and oil and gas play in the system and in, in some of the benefits they bring and some of the challenges as we move to a less energy dense system. Just to kind of give you a sense of batteries, you know, we often think of batteries as, you know, being something that's in our phone or our computer or our Tesla or our F-150 Lightning or whatever your uh, electric appliance of choice may be. But when you look at just the sheer energy density of a coal pile or the line pack in a natural gas line, it helps give you a sense why even though there's externalities with these energy sources, they tend to stay in the system longer than we might expect them to. Next slide, please. And this high energy density also sets a benchmark for other competing fuels. And just to, to give you an illustration here of you know, some of the challenges that we face as we look to diversify the world's fuels portfolio is if you're trying to offset just 1% of global carbon energy use at current levels, you would need a bit over 100 uh, large scale nuclear reactors of the type that, you know, are deployed fairly widely in the world. Now, that would be about a quarter of the global fleet. If you're looking at wind farms, you would need basically 600 gigawatt class wind farms. And just to put that number in perspective for you, you know, a place like China, which is a leading wind power builder, a, a good year, they'll add 40 to 50 gigawatts of capacity. And so, you know, something that's almost an order of magnitude less than the numbers we're seeing here just to displace globally 1% of carbon energy use. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the other things to consider, and this is applicable both in the, the high income countries and also some of the countries that are coming up the development ladder and looking to ensure affordable and abundant energy supplies is even industries that sometimes we almost think of as postmodern. And I think the tech space, the, the Netflix and the Facebook and the Googles and all the others of the world, we think of this as being a less energy intense set of enterprises in the reality is even for instance the servers that our data flows over as i'm speaking with you right now are underpinned by stable and highly available electricity just to kind of you know put it in perspective for you a hyperscale data center can generate an can, can require an electricity load on par with what a steel mini mill would need and so these are big industrial uh, centimegawatt scale types of applications we're looking at. Next slide, please. 
And just in case, again, you know, to come back to trust but verify here, this is a recent satellite image of a data center just south of Beijing in northern China. They literally have a captive power plant on site. So again, kind of hammering home that even the digital economy is not immune to the need for abundant and secure energy supplies. And something we have to be very cognizant of is as we work on energy transition efforts. Next slide, please. And so in our current research, we characterize the present period as the world being in the energy van, uh, transition valley of death. And what I mean by this is if you look at the first 10 to 15 years of very intensive energy transition efforts, the fruits of which we even see here in our own home state of Texas, you see penetration of wind power, of solar power. Uh, you see a lot more natural gas availability. We've harvested a lot of the lowest hanging fruit, and now we're starting to enter a period where, for instance, you have to think about how to more fully price intermittency in our electricity systems. We have to start contemplating the next big set of investments that we might need to not only displace legacy coal in a country like ours, but also to encourage places like China, like India, like uh, places in Southeast Asia, such as Indonesia and Malaysia that are growing rapidly to help nudge them onto a path that is more likely to embrace gas and nuclear and renewables than it is to embrace coal. And this is really probably the most challenging five to eight year window of this entire process. It's something that if it's derailed by shock events, whether they be the war in Ukraine, whether they be blackouts, whether they be any other types of system perturbations, you can slow the process. And this has a compounding adverse effect over time. Uh, conversely, if things do proceed more smoothly and you're able to start getting scale up, it sets the stage for a 2030s and a 2040s and a 2050s period where we're able to get on a path that the snowball starts really gaining mass as it moves down the hill. Next slide, please. So another important thing to think of, and I think this builds on some of what I just said, is we've seen from past history that energy insecurity can undermine climate goals. Uh, if you look at the great state of Wyoming, it's not just about Yellowstone and fishing and hunting and, and beautiful outdoor vistas. It's also a coal superpower. And what really made it a coal superpower was the Arab oil embargo in 1973. And you, you see this in the graph on the right there, where Wyoming basically just had a negligible amount of coal production for many, many years. And then come the oil embargo and the search for more secure energy resources, looks like a fighter jet taking off this explosive rise in production. The only thing that tipped that over and helped it start trending downwards was an equally tremendous boom in shale gas that we saw beginning in the mid 2000s. Next slide, please. And so as we look at the non-OECD world, and this is why it's so important to look beyond our borders, to look beyond European borders, is even if the OECD world went to net zero for CO2 emissions tomorrow, we would still only bring the world back to where we were in 2003 or 2004. And so this is something where energy transition starts at home. It's something that you know it really has to be thought of in global terms. Next slide, please. One of the other things to consider is, you know, we've learned through the Ukraine war that much of the world outside of the United States, outside of Western Europe, values its independence and its ability to, to chart its own course and operate from kind of a, a position of neutralism. That's adhered to much more deeply than I think many policymakers appreciated prior to the stress events that began in February of this year. One thing, however, I think we can be assured of is that all of these countries, whether you're looking at China, whether you're looking at India, the Southeast countries in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so forth, they are not neutral when it comes to the virtues and the benefits of securing the energy supplies that they need to alleviate energy poverty, that they need to support industrial growth and development and so forth. And one of the things we find over and over in human history is you tend to get your energy from something that's abundant locally. If you're here in the United States, we're fortunate that we have abundant natural gas that's been unlocked by the, the shale revolution. 
But if you're in a context like China, and this is the, the right-hand side chart there, coal is your easily available resource. And if there's not something that knocks your energy trajectory off that inertial path, that's the fuel source that you're most likely to embrace. And it's one that has real consequences locally. And it also has consequences globally, because even if we're divided by some of our national and political differences, we share a common biosphere. And so there'll really be some significant policy challenges that we have to grapple with in the next uh, couple of decades here on these issues. Next slide, please. Now, we do have a positive path ahead. Uh, next slide, please. We have to embrace all sources. And, you know, I've, I've sort of been on a doom scroll with you, I think, in some ways over the last 15 minutes or so here. We're going to now turn to a bit more positive set of things to, to close, close this talk out. So first of all, if we just look empirically at chemistry, if we're serious about energy transition efforts and cleaning and greening, it tells us which fuel to displace first. That's coal. It's, uh, you know, it's something that's about 50% or about a third more uh, carbon dioxide intensive than oil is. And it's almost twice as CO2 intensive as natural gas. And this is even before we get into some of the other associated emissions. Next slide, please. W we also need to acknowledge that even if energy transition efforts so far may not be going quite as fast as some people might want them to, we already arguably have a very significant global emissions transition that is underway. If you look at natural gas, what you see here is something where we're now approaching a quarter of global energy supplies, primary energy coming from natural gas, but it only accounts for a little bit over 20% of carbon dioxide emissions. If you're looking at coal, the situation is almost reversed where it's a slightly bigger share. It's a little bit over a quarter of global primary energy, but it's also, you know, you're approaching half of global carbon dioxide emissions. And so right there, you see a swap opportunity from embracing natural gas where you still have energy density, you still have scalability and you can make great emissions progress. And it's not just on the carbon dioxide front you knock out particulates, you knock out mercury, you knock out sulfur, and so on and so forth. It seems like a low-hanging fruit that would make sense to continue harvesting. Next slide, please. I think another very positive thing to think about is we've proven over the last 50 years that we can not only become more efficient, we can also become more energy abundant and we can become more prosperous at the same time. If you look at what happened in the wake of the Arab oil embargo in the early 1970s, you've seen dramatic departures from a trajectory where economic growth and energy use used to be very tightly correlated to a trajectory where they're now very much decoupled and we've seen continuing economic growth and we've really dropped our energy intensities dramatically. And it's something that I think as we continue to embrace technology, we're likely to see more of moving forward. Next slide, please. The other thing to think about is how this efficiency feeds through the entire value chain, especially as we embrace technology, you have to uh, forgive my semiconductor image there, but this is something that goes through the entire value chain. And just to kind of quantify what the impacts look like, if we were to look at the last 50 odd or close to 60 years of global growth in energy use, if we look at a future where we imagine going out to 2050, just at the trailing 10 year average rate of growth versus one where we were operating at half of that rate, you're effectively avoiding an amount of energy use that's roughly equivalent to what China uses now. And so something that is, it's tremendous, it's transformative. And again, as, as, as we've seen from some of the efficiency enhancements in the US and other places since the 1970s, it's something that if we leverage technology is eminently achievable. Next slide, please. And finally, to close out here, some of the key words in the, the concepts I, I really hope to, to leave you with today, scale is critical, energy density is critical, and embracing imperfection is something that's also critical. And you, you see here with the little pictograph that I've given you because I'm a bit of a caveman. So coal obviously gets a big red X. It's, it's, it's something that we see the externalities, we see the problems. We, we, we can also clearly see why countries would embrace it. But I think on balance, 
externalities clearly outweigh benefits in the case of this fuel if we're looking from a sustainability perspective. If we're looking at natural gas, is it perfect? No. Does it still have carbon emissions? Yes. Are there other challenges associated with development? Absolutely. But is it worlds better than what the alternative would be? I think the answer there is yes as well. That gets a green check. Nuclear, one that if we continue to embrace and scale up, we get the energy density, we get the terawatt scale power delivery capability that we need to sustain our world in coming years through whatever challenges we face. Big green check and renewables as well, despite their flaws, something that I think will play a critical role in the system, albeit perhaps at a smaller scale than some of the advocates of those energy sources uh, might think these days. So we're on a we're we're engaged right now in a Manhattan project level effort. I think this is something we can do. We have to accept the bumps in the road. And it's certainly something from my own personal perspective, I look forward to putting my shoulder to the wheel and working alongside people like you folks. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be very happy to take your questions. And so I'm starting to see some of the questions come in here in the chat box. And so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go based on what I can see. And I'll, I'll apologize if I uh, inadvertently miss anyone's questions. So I see here, I'll just go chronologically. Is hydrogen fuel cost competitive with alternative energy sources? I, I have not run the numbers on this. I, I, I think at this point, hydrogen is still in many ways going to be very closely price linked to natural gas, because that's going to be one of your main hydrogen carriers that you're extracting it from. And if you think about adding the energy into the process necessary to accomplish that extraction and, you know, also maybe find something to do with the CO2, we're probably not quite there yet. You know, the way I think of it, I guess, in a, in a very preliminary way is sort of the conversation we had about electric vehicle batteries and their costs in say the 2010 to 2011 timeframe is probably kind of where we are with hydrogen now where you know we haven't yet fully factored in some of the scale and other things that could enable us to make it a, a little more price competitive now Moving to the next question here, what steps can the U.S. take as the world's second largest energy consumer to accelerate energy transition efforts and do so in a politically sustainable and, and bipartisan fashion? I think one of the biggest ones is to openly embrace an all of the above energy sourcing approach. There's not going to be a silver bullet here. It's going to be a silver shotgun shell. It's something where I think wind and solar, frankly speaking, are the politically favored sources, especially with the present administration. But I think we have to understand that what has enabled those to enter the system at scale so far, it, it has really been the abundance of natural gas and its ability to serve as a chemical battery. And I think the lesson we need to take away is we need to continue building wind and solar. We also need to dramatically revamp our, our view on nuclear and start building there. And we need to continue embracing natural gas. It does play a critical role as a bridge fuel. And if we can use this combination first to knock coal out of the system and then you know start moving down the ladder, this is something that I think yields very broad benefits. I, I think also to that, we need to have a very serious conversation about robust and transparent carbon pricing uh, you know, I think a carbon fee is something, if we think about the amount of investment in renewables now, something on the order of $100 billion a year, if you had a transparent set of carbon pricing that incentivized newer energy sources to enter the system in kind of a source agnostic way, you could probably be looking at several times that amount or more. It's really something we should think of as an opportunity. Now, if we think about the... Uh, Russia-Ukraine war here and what it means for energy transition efforts, I think it puts us in a danger period. You know, we already see in Europe a reversion to coal, a reversion to oil and even fuel oil in some cases as people frantically scramble to fill energy gaps. And I think, again, this is a reason why we want to really embrace some of the scalable energy sources that we already largely have the technology at our fingertips so that we can, we can stay the course uh, despite these bumps here 
Now, energy benefits, the next question, energy benefits if we converted existing coal power plants to supercritical technology with lesser emissions. It depends where you're looking. If you're looking at China, they have already largely embraced supercritical technology. They're really a technology leader because coal is foundational to them the way gas is to us. I think India is maybe trailing a little bit. The problem in the United States and Europe is our coal plants are mostly legacy facilities that were built 40 or 50 years ago in many cases. And I suspect the cost of a retrofit, especially in today's tumultuous environment, is probably something that's going to deter those type of investments. And I would suspect that retiring them and replacing them with gas or with other sources would probably be a more likely course of action for anybody who's looking to take their coal assets out of the system. So I see that I'm out of time here. I'll continue responding and writing to your questions. I thank you all for your time and attention. Back to you, Lars.